to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Uh, yesterday, uh, my wife Cindy and I uh, paddled out. We're here in Cocoa Beach, Florida at the time. We're, you know, we spent half our time here, half in Hawaii. And we went out to go stand up paddling. And uh, it was going to be a really cool experience because we paddled out. And we're looking to the north, and there's going to be a rocket launch. We're in Cocoa Beach, and there's going to be a rocket launch. There's going to be a rocket launch. Uh, launching about 10 miles north of us and we were going to watch it and see it go on a beautiful crystal blue sky and uh, many many people down on the beach everybody facing the same direction it's almost like waiting for the return of Jesus Christ you know and and there's and and, and you watch everybody and you watch everybody and I'm looking at my watch well the the rocket should have launched by now you know from what we had seen that they had, they had they go through this process they've they've it's, it was running on its own power all the fuel was up and running and it should have launched. And we were paddling really hard into the wind, uh, you know, making sure we were going upwind so we'd see it when it launched. And it never launched. And it's really sad. I mean, everybody kind of walks his way. Mike, Vice President Mike Pence had been here the day before. The same thing happened. It was an aborted launch. And you think about a rocket, you know, it's meant to fly into outer space. Uh, I mean, it's still a rocket whether it launches into outer space or not, but it's kind of lost its, its purpose, you know, you, it, it, and it's so much like human beings, you know, if you, if you're a human being and you have all this, this, this spiritual, rational soul that God's given you and you have the, your physical body and, and all this potential, uh, but you never have a relationship with Jesus, it's like a launch that's never, it's like a rocket that has never launched. You're human, but are you fully human if you haven't opened yourself up to, uh, the, the, opened up that cap capacity that you have been given to say, Lord, I give you my life, not my will, as Jesus said, but thy will be done. Uh, and you haven't abandoned yourself to God's will. You've missed out on a great, great, great adventure. And so uh, our, our TV show, our, our ministry, our radio show, everything that we do, our creed is that the, the wildest thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the adventure of God's will. And I was thinking of Aslan, the lion. He said, I'm, I'm a good lion, but that doesn't mean I'm a tame lion. So throwing yourself into the, into the arms of God and the will of God is the most exciting adventure you can have. And I got goosebumps right now because our guest uh, means so much to me. His books over the years that I've read and just getting to know him. We have as my co-adventure guide today a man who's on a genuine adventure, Mike Aquilina. Aloha, Mike. Hey, Bear. How you doing? I'm doing great. I mean, when you, you know, people watch the show. I guess maybe a couple million people listen to this on radio, but people watch the show on our YouTube app. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, they, uh, they, if they could see you right now, uh, if they were, were, to, were to go to our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak, uh, a moment ago, your camera turned a little bit, and I realized that this little, the, the, the books that you're surrounded by in this nook that you're in, <laughs> if you look down, it looks like, it looks like a row of, it look, there's row after row after row of books. It looks like where <laughs> Indiana Jones would, would have put the Ark of the Covenant. So it goes on forever. It does. It does. So, um, Mike, we, you, you uh, are one of two or three of my most returning guests. I just love getting, having you on the show. And, I love uh, the show. This is fun. Uh, uh, yeah, get, we get to have a little bit of fun together. Um, you have that set of books behind you, the ancient, what is it called again? Oh, the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. Yep. Right. And I was interviewing Pete Sox the other day. He has this, you turned him on to the same, same one. And, you know, I got a set of those books this summer. It was my early Christmas present from my wife, so I just, I just love them. Isn't it wonderful? Any, any verse of Scripture, you just look up that verse and you can see what the earliest Christian teachers said about that particular verse. So you're there in the midst of our, our fathers in the faith, and you're, you're getting their insights on, on the, the Scriptures that are most puzzling to you or most important to you. That's so cool. And then, like, But here's the rabbit hole. So you're reading, I'm reading the commentary on the book of Acts, right? Yeah. yeah. A, lot, a lot of Athanasius in there. Yeah. So now, now I have the, the writings of the early church fathers. So now I've pulled out the Athanasius book, 
And now I'm going through all of that stuff. So it's like a, it's like an infinitely de- deep, uh, you know, it's like, I think a gold miner, you know, chipping away at a, in a cave, sees a vein of gold and he follows it. And then, well, where does this go? Or what does this go? Where does this go? And you can, you can never uh, get enough. So thank it's you. It's a wonderful life. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. Um, if you may not be listening to this during the Christmas holidays. Uh, if you're wa- if you're watching this on YouTube or on one of our podcasts, but uh, it is a wonderful life. It's a Christmas season right now. Yes, it is. Um, I've got in front of me the, the new book that you that uh, just came out. When I saw it was coming out, I went into Amazon and reserved it, so it came to me as soon as it could possibly could. Villains of the Early Church. What inspired you to to write that? What inspired me? Well, I'll tell you what what did. I uh, uh, one thing I've noticed over over many years of reading the early church fathers is that many of them were trained in the art of rhetoric. You know, uh, right? They they could they could really speak and they could really write and uh, and they knew how to to inject a lot of drama into their sentences. It's true. And huh? Very yeah. And very few things animated them as much as their enemies. Okay, mm. that that uh, these people who had set themselves against the church fathers, or set themselves against the church, or set themselves against Jesus Christ, they were the ones who could really get the master rhetoricians riled up. And when a master <laughs> rhetorician gets riled up, he hurls his best <laughs> insults out there. So I noticed that I, you know, underlining and highlighting. All of these great insults, and I at some point I thought, wouldn't it be great to pull together all of the the church fathers' best insults and uh, and best uh, best tirades and right. most entertaining passages? And and I knew that the best way to do that would be by uh, by writing about the villains of the early church. Yeah, and you know they did they did us a favor, and I mean, in a way, because they <clears throat> the villains helped us, were challenged us to really understand our faith. I, I forget the, the quote from Augustine, but it, they really challenged us and they made us think deeper, go deeper, yeah. and get a fuller grasp of, of, uh, of what uh, the, the doctrine of the church should be. That's right. They shake us out of our complacency. Uh, if, if, it, if the villains are within the church and they're heretics, then we have to deepen our understanding of the mysteries. We have to go deeper in contemplation. We have to go deeper in prayer and study and all of these other good things right. that we'd probably rather not do. You know, we'd yeah. rather put around in the backyard or or poke around in the engine of the car or, you know, do do something on a hobby. Go golfing, you know? And 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 when these people challenge us, then we have to put all that aside and we have to go deeper. So heretics make us do that. But, you know, persecutors do, too. The people who attack us from outside and come after us with both guns blazing. You know, we have to build up our defense at that point and, and maybe even a counteroffensive. And in order to do that, again, we have to go deeper in prayer, deeper in contemplation, deeper in study. You know, so what I'm thinking right now is that, thank, thank God there wasn't uh... – golfing or or bowling or athanasius might have been uh focused more on that than hey you know what <laughs> there are always distractions you can put me in a cell with nothing in it and i'll find a way to be distracted yeah i was looking at a, one of my you know i love to read, read old books and i was looking at one of the old books and there was a drawing uh in in rock of a baseball bat and a ball, you know, from way back then, it was a more like a cricket bat. But I mean, from way, way, way back, you're right there. Yeah, there are always distractions. And you know, I yes. look, at, I'm looking at your uh, this beautiful library uh, that you have, and it's just like it, it, you're you're an author. You, you uh, uh, writers are readers, <laughs> and you've just been able to soak up so much from all of these these different books, and it must just be a I I want to, like I said earlier, I want when, when we were off air, I want to be like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, this is living the dream, getting paid to read and write. Uh, and and uh, you know, it's not what I've been able to do all my life, but uh, but it, it's it's definitely what I was working toward when I was in my twenties and thirties. Okay, and, that's what I, you know. I was thinking about this the other day while I was reading your new book. Um, when did Mike realize this was what he was? This was the path he was going to get to live. You know you. I, yeah, I think a lot of it was very gradual, and uh, 
Uh, you know, and when I was in college, I didn't declare a major until they made me declare a major. They said, declare a major or leave Penn State University, you know, and I was doing a lot of things. I was, um, I was, uh, you know, a, a majoring or not majoring yet. I was, I was, um, working a couple of jobs uh, on campus. I, I worked as a janitor in order to get myself through. I, I worked for the football program as an academic tutor and um, did a lot of those things. And uh, And finally, I had to declare a major. And uh, I ended up getting uh, um, an internship in the publishing industry. So I figured I'd declare English. Uh, uh, but that was kind of a fluke. I just kind of stumbled into it. Uh, somebody, one of my professors offered me the internship without my going for it. So I, my first job in publishing and, and it worked out, you know, my next job came out of my first job and so on down the road, just God kept kicking the can down the road yeah. and uh, yeah. <laughs> kicking my can down the road. So I, you know, I worked in the tech field for about eight years. Uh, and then I, I worked for a newspaper and, and, and after that I went freelance, I had made enough contacts, um, in, in publishing that I could go freelance. And that's, that's what I've wanted to do. That's, that's what I decided I wanted to do. And that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, we're talking with Mike Aquilina. He's the author of the new book that just came out within the last week, Villains of the Early Church. We got to take a break, Mike. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We get to do this radio show because we have two really great sponsors, Solidarity Healthcare that some of my family members are on, uh, and also Notre Dame Federal Credit Union, uh, the largest Catholic credit union in the, in the world. And uh, we want to recommend both of, the, both of them to you. Uh, you can go to our website, deepadventure.com, and you can uh, click on the, on the link there. I can, I can assure you uh, personally that their service is, is second to none and that they're, they're great people. So we thank them so much for allowing us to come to you. Today we have as our, our co-adventure guide, Mike Aquilina. Mike, I, when we're talking about his newest book, Villains of the Early Church, but we were talking a little bit about this, this genesis, this, this progression towards you becoming an author. So when you were with the newspapers, were you writing at that time? Yeah, well, uh, the the job I took at the newspaper was an editorial job. I was editor of the newspaper, actually. So... Um, so, uh, so I, but I was doing a lot of writing because we were a small staff and, uh, and I found myself writing features and of course writing the editorial every week, um, and occasional columns, opinion columns. So, uh, so I did all kinds of writing then, uh, I, I did it for three years and then I went freelance. Yeah. So writing those short articles is a, it takes a real skill. It'd be easier to write a long article than a short one in some ways, right? Cause you, it, you have to pack so much in. So it's oh, really, sure. you really developed a skill. Yeah, and you have to learn to write on the fly. By then, I, I I knew how to do that because of my work in the tech field. We we put out all kinds of publications, uh, and we were always always on a short deadline. Were you writing uh, like the technical manuals or something, or technical writing? Well, no, not not technical writing so much as uh, their promotional writing, which oh. is which is a different kind of thing <laughs> because you have to you have to make these big technical ideas accessible to the people who are actually buying the devices. It was a great, and, and these are obscure devices, you know, protocol converters and that sort of thing. Yeah. This was back in the day. It's almost like you have to first let people know they have a need and then explain why yours is the best one to fulfill that need. They didn't and even know are, they had. <laughs> right. And, and these are non-technical people. So you yeah. have to, you have to write it in ordinary language. It, it was a challenge. But I think it really school, it really prepared you. Those two positions really prepared you. What was your first book? My first book, um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I edited a collection of the writings of Father John Hugo, who was Dorothy Day's spiritual director. Dorothy Day is wow. an American woman who's up for canonization now. Um, but uh, uh, her spiritual director was Father John Hugo, who was a priest of my diocese, the Diocese of Pittsburgh. And uh, together with David Scott, I edited that book, a collection of his writings. It's called Weapons of the Spirit. And what about uh, the, the first book that was your basically your your own baby? Well, uh, that was my own baby. It was the Fathers of the Church. That the Fathers that book, of the that book's huge. 
Yeah, it's still and now it's in its third edition. It's still in print, and it's it's a standard textbook for seminaries and universities, and uh, and a popular book too. I didn't write it to be a college textbook. I wrote it so that my junior high son could read it, and uh, and it's it's ended up serving a lot of purposes besides uh, uh, the the edification and entertainment of my junior high son. Well, I really think I mean that's really true about your writing. I mean that th- it's so engaging. Uh, and you explain things so that people like I can uh, I can understand them. Oh, thank uh, you. You know, but that but it's it is. I was thinking about that. This is written in. in I was thinking about it. This is written so that someone who reads a newspaper, anyone who reads a newspaper, could understand this. And, well, I tried to make it funny. <laughs> yeah, and you also draw people in, like you have to do in the headlines of a newspaper. So I kind of get that. But yeah. let, let's. I, I've always been curious because I I love writing. I I uh, want to be like Mike. I want to, you know, I want to do I want to do that. But I guess you know I I write. Uh, the TV show, and I've mm-hmm. written a couple right. of books, but I, I would love to just hide in a corner someplace and just write. I love, <laughs> I love the process of writing. I just love it. Um, but we're, we're talking with Mike Aquilina about his newest book, Villains of the Early Church. And uh, among all these villains, which one is your favorite? <laughs> well, I guess, I, guess uh, I have favorite chapters in the book. Yeah, okay. And my favorite one? chapters are the funniest ones, and, and those would be the chapters on Nero and Nestorius. And and uh, in both cases, I think it's because the guys were big buffoons, you know, and and also because a lot of people in their own time recognized that and left us abundant records of their buffoonery. So I'm able to pack an awful lot into those chapters about the things these people did that that were offensive or uh, just plain stupid or really provoked strong responses from the early Early church fathers. I want to hear Nero. Nero. I, how do you well, how do you pronounce his name? I say, I say Nero. I, well, uh, we say Nero. I think Nero. In so I, that's well, the way I say it. Well, Nero, 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 right? Right. <laughs> right. He really was like the 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 emperor who you know the old saying, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. He thinks he has invisible clothes clothes on that are invisible. But right. He really d- didn't understand what everybody else thought about him and. It, Give us, give us the narr- his story. Well, I don't know that he didn't understand it, or that he did. Maybe it was that he didn't care. Well, when he was winning races, he uh, he lost and things. Like, oh, give man. us the story. This was a young man. He was a young man. Can you he was give a us young the highlight man. of his life? He was a young man, and he tended uh, to move forward by by killing people who might be in his way. Uh, I think he had the example of his mother before him, uh, because his mother had a had a habit of doing the same thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she ended up being one of his victims. Nero, Nero killed his mother, killed his wife, uh, killed his unborn child. He just killed what was in his way. Uh, that's not the funny part, but, uh, but, um, he, he got to, he, he, he was a narcissist. You know, he fat, he fancied himself an artist, a poet, a, a, a singer, an actor, you know, and he liked to be center stage. He liked to have a lot of people looking at him, laughing at his jokes, um, weeping at his poetry and that sort of thing. And let's face it, he's the emperor. He can Mm. kill you and he has a track record of killing people. So when he's reciting his poems, you'd better be crying in the front row. If he's telling a joke, you'd better be laughing. If he submits his poetry in 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 a contest... He'd better get the prize, or the judges are in danger. Well, you were you know, saying he got prize. He got prizes from places he didn't even submit his poetry. That's right. That's right. They just give it to Nero, and and then he wanted to fancy himself an athlete, so so he would get in a chariot and and race um, against the professionals in the chariot races. Hey, now. Are you going to be the one who beats him in the race? <laughs> no, because you're going to die if you do. So Nero Nero just won everything because er- everyone knew he was a narcissist and everyone knew he was a murderer. I, he was um, amazing. He was an amazing athlete, an amazing poet. <laughs> I don't know where you get off on talking about the emperor like that. <laughs> you know, and, and now, 2,000 years later, it's funny to see this. I mean, it's the stuff of comedy. At the time, it wasn't so funny to live in the midst of it. But, you know, we can laugh now. It wasn't funny to be a Christian in the time of Nero because he was the one who instituted the Roman persecution that lasted about 275 years. 
You know, this went on for centuries, but he's the one who provided a legal precedent for it because he blamed the Christians for the fire that consumed a good portion of Rome. He want, he set the fire, most likely. I, I, that's he, what I think. I mean, I, that's what yeah. I want to think. It seems like it's it it's in line with who he is. It's he in said, line with who he is. And what did he do with that area of the city that burned? He built himself a palace there. Uh, sounds kind of suspicious to me, you know? But this is in the time when you have Paul and Peter kind of caught up in the whole thing. So yeah. this is around 67 AD. I'm trying to remember the, the somewhere. Yeah, 60, 64 AD is when, um, is when they, they died. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the lifetime of the apostles. The apostles are working in that city. And uh, there's already a well-established Christian community. Uh, it's viewed with suspicion. Why? Well, because they're observing uh, a moral code that is definitely at variance with the general population, especially in terms of sexual morality. So they, their neighbors feel judged, mm. okay? And they kind of resent the happiness that the Christians yeah. exude. So yeah. there's a lot of... Uh, uh, sentiment that runs against the Christians at that time. So you can see how Nero um, would find an easy scapegoat in the Christians. A lot of them were foreigners. Um, uh, they had Jewish associations, and the Romans really didn't like the Jews. Uh, so they were looked upon as as foreign and, uh, and contrarian, and these are people who would be easy to blame for a big fire. We're talking with Mike Aquilina in his new book, The Villains of the Early Church. Uh, which is, I think, a great read for us at this time because we have to realize when you read these, you see that the Holy Spirit, in spite of all of the uh, persecution and, and uh, heresies and things that came forth, the Holy Spirit was faithful and purified and, uh, and brought the church through more beautiful and stronger than ever. This is Bear Wozniak. We want to invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com, especially the men if you're listening. You can go there and you can join Bear's Man Cave just by clicking a button uh, and you get invited then to become a part of our secret Facebook group, which you cannot, you can't go to the Facebook group to join. You have to go to our website. And then we get together about every couple of weeks and we have a man cave meetup using Zoom video chat and all the men post uh, things that challenge each other, encourage each other, help mobilize each other. So we'd love for you to go visit our, our website and also subscribe to our, our email. This is Bear. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're talking with my, my co-adventure guide, Mike Aquilina. He's surrounded by books. I, I asked him, I asked you earlier, what would happen if you just pushed one of those shelves? Would they all, would it be a domino effect or some? How many shelves are there? I don't know. They're, they're Ikea shelves, so they're all interlocked and interconnected. It would be hard for them to fall over. Yeah, I but, guess that, that keeps me safe. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Mike, if they're Ikea, that means you assembled them. Uh, yeah, that's true. That, that might is be the... <laughs> fatal flaw. <laughs> that's the flaw in your logic there. <laughs> Good intentions though. <laughs> but it is like that. I think with the heresies too, you know, once you, once you, uh, once you find uh, the truth and it, it becomes like a row of, uh, a domino effect of, of syllogism, syllogism. If this is yeah. true, that must be true. If this is right. true. That must be true. But once you break the code on a false heresy, uh, on a heresy, uh, then it, it can open up so much insight. Uh, yes. Let's talk a li my favorite heresy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not Gnosticism, but Arianism. Arianism, yeah. Let's talk about that and Acast Nestorianism too, I guess that would follow up with that, be part of that discussion. Let's talk about that, that area in your book, uh, Villains of the Early Church. Let's talk about Arius. Well, Arius was a priest of the city of Alexandria in Egypt, and he, um, he, uh, he had trained in the city of Antioch, which was a rival city and a rival church in a sense. They, they, had, they had a different way of doing things, different way of approaching the scriptures and that sort of thing. But Arius, even for, for, for Antioch, was kind of an extremist, and, uh, and he, he took an extreme view of, in his reading of scripture— uh, he uh, he did not recognize Jesus as co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. 
Now, if you accept that, then you're denying the Trinity. You're denying that God is an eternal father. And he did outright. He denied God's eternal fatherhood. So he said that um, there was a time when the word did not exist, the divine word. There was when he was not. And he set the, these ideas to music so that they could spread more easily throughout throughout the land. They were like, they were like hymns, right? Yes, right. So he, um, uh, he, he, um, he was listening to his bishop, Alexander, uh, preach one day, and Alexander was preaching on the Trinity, and Arius stood up and denounced his bishop. Okay? Well, the, the bishop didn't take too kindly to that, and he, he denounced Arius in return. But a, bishop, a bishop's denunciation has some teeth to it, okay? And, uh, and, and, uh, and so he, he suspended Arius in his ministry. He condemned his teaching. And that sort of thing, but Arius continued to um, uh, to make connections. He was a, a master of what we would today call networking. You know, he got to know influential people. He got them on his side, and uh, and and he put up um, put up a, a pretty good counterattack to his bishop. And the Arian doctrine began to spread out there from Alexandria. And once he was exiled, then it, it just spread further. Uh, so, so people started to take up this heresy. And uh, the way St. Jerome describes it, he said, the world suddenly awoke to find itself Arian. It's like you wake up one day and all of your neighbors have accepted this heresy, this heresy that denies that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Now, that's a dangerous thing. Because that changes everything. That changes the meaning of the gospel. That changes the meaning of salvation. It changes everything uh, in Christianity. So he had great success. And again, he was able to win over some influential people. And it created a crisis in the church. Such a, a, a threat to unity in the church that the emperor had to, had to call a council in order to solve this problem. And he called the Council of Nicaea, the first great ecumenical council of the church. He was, um, going, to bring, it was going to bring civil war in his, in his empire. I mean, right. he was concerned and, about... From a, yeah. Yeah, for uh, imp the unity of his people. So he thought that there was going to be war. Uh, there had been riots over this. So, so, so they called the council, and the bishops overwhelmingly, uh, uh, you know... Uh, ruled against Arius and in favor of the doctrine of Alexander. Now, Alexander died shortly after the council, and he was succeeded by his secretary, a man named Athanasius. And I know Athanasius is a great favorite of yours, Bear, yeah. but Athanasius was a great saint and, a, and a, uh, just a, a tough guy. You know, he was exiled many times from his see. You know, he spent decades away from his city, living in hiding, uh, because, uh, because he had a death sentence looming over him. He because, was, Ar yeah. He was pushed out into the desert, and then I think he went, he was forced over to Gaul, too, right? Yeah, he was, he, yeah, sure, and so here's this Egyptian who has to live in the cold countries, you know, uh, and, and suffer our winters. But Ari uh, Arianism, to me, was the first uh, political correctness. It was so much easier for people to accept yeah. a, a Jesus who wasn't a god, you know, who, was, right. who wasn't you know, the eternally begotten son of God. And most of the military became Aryan at some point. Was that during this, this period of time? Well, the, 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 the Aryan the, crisis was not solved by the council of Nicaea, uh, because a, a lot of people just didn't go along with it. They found workarounds and loopholes and that sort of thing. And then, uh, you know, the successor of Constantine, his son, Constantius was an Aryan. So you yeah. had the imperial power behind it, and you had people naming Arian bishops, and so it it the, the crisis continued, and uh, and it was a it was a it was a dangerous thing for Athanasius repeatedly. Um, so he had to he had to fight. You know, now can uh, I ask can I ask you a yeah. question before we go go that? Can I please believe the story that uh, Saint Nicholas punched out <laughs> Arius? <laughs> you can believe it if you like. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of contemporary historical evidence in favor of that. Uh, and and uh, St. Nicholas is even absent from the lists of some, uh, some of the lists of the people who attended the Council of Nicaea. So, um, so, uh, so there's not a lot behind it, but you can believe what you want to believe. I'm going to say, Mike, you, you can Mike, believe he's Santa Claus if you want. <laughs> I, I want to believe that Santa Claus, that, that was the first bad Santa. 
as they say. <laughs> <laughs> but this was a very insidious thing. In fact, I think Constantine, uh, you know, back in those days, the emperors would wait till the end uh, often to be baptized because they, being an emperor was a kind of a bloody deal sometimes. And I think, wasn't he baptized by an Arian bishop? Yeah, yeah, a problematic bishop, that's for sure. And yeah. he, uh, and he was baptized, uh, you know, at the end of his life because because Constantine himself was a problematic figure. Uh, you know, he was, as you point out, a violent man. Uh, you know, we talked about Nero uh, having yeah. all of these these family members killed. Well, Constantine had his son killed and yeah. his wife, his first right. wife. So, so there was a lot of that in his background as well. And then Con- Constantius, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce his name quite right. Constantius. Constantius. Yeah. Was he was he the the emperor during the time of Augustine? No, no, no. He didn't live. He didn't live that late. And by the time Augustine came around, you know, we're talking about um, that's after the emperor Theodosius, who firmly established orthodoxy and really enacted laws against any other variant forms of of Christianity. So Theodosius okay. kind of ruled out a lot of the heretics that had plagued the church up to that point. And when did when New did Jul- arise. When did Julian the Apostate come about then? Before? Well, he was he was a little interlude there uh, uh-huh. in the Christian era. Uh, Julian was a, a a Christian who did renounced his Christianity and tried to repaganize the empire. Uh, he 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 died in 363. So uh, and and he ruled just a couple of years. So uh, it was a very brief rule, but it was a, a rule that was a, a genuine threat against Christianity. But he went, didn't he go to school with Gregory of Nyssa and... and uh, Basil the Great and Gregory of Nazianzus, right. Gregory of Nazianzus and Basil the Great. So they went to school together, you know, seminary, basically, or theology school, I don't know what you call it. And then here's yeah. their, their good buddy becomes the emperor, and now he uh, wants to return Rome to paganism. Sure, and he was another guy who made life difficult for Athanasius. Yeah. So, uh, so you find poor Athanasius uh, facing up all these challenges, but with God's grace, he proved himself equal to these these challenges, these impossible enemies that he faced. Yeah, you know, it was so the the whole world became uh, uh, the whole church uh, became Arian, and yet the Holy Spirit prevailed. And that's, that's right. Great, that's great hope for us in our time. And we came through stronger and, right. and clearer in our doctrine. So it toughens us. It sharpens us. What about Nestorianism then? Nestorianism came about in the next generation. And, uh, and uh, Nestorius was kind of a funny well, you guy. Know what? You know what, Mike? I, I get so involved, I forget I have to take a break. <laughs> we'll, we'll come <laughs> so back. I- but, but I mean, Nestorianism has a, a, has a next, has a, uh, he, he's like the sequel. It's the, yes. The Arianism, Nestorianism both revealed real truth. Uh, this is Bear Wozniak. You can go to our website, deepadventure.com, find out more about our ministry, and you can buy Mike Aquilina's new book, Villains of the Early Church. We'll, uh, we'll be right back with more with Mike Aquilina. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. When Mike and I, Mike Aquilina, who's my guest today, when we talk, I just get all wrapped up and I forget I'm ha- I, have, I have a radio show. <laughs> and, and with radio shows means you have to take a break, but we're back from that break. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a horse when it gets close to the barn, it smells that alfalfa. When I'm with you, I just start, I just start sprinting and I forget that I have a I job do. to do here. But, but I, we were talking about Arianism and, yeah. and Nestorianism and how... It was kind of like a one-two punch, and how yes. how us us having to deal with that, the church having to deal with that, really revealed some beautiful truth. So uh, the truth of Arianism, what what was the strongest truth that came from that? And then let's go into Nestorianism. Oh yes, well you know Nestorianism was a, 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 a kind of a funny thing because Nestorius was kind of a funny guy. Uh, he remember Felix Unger on the Odd Couple? Yes, yeah, that was him. He was kind of that was him. <laughs> You know, he was kind of fussy, you know, and he liked things to be just so. And he was one of these guys who was always correcting you. He said, well, technically, that's not true. You know, no matter yeah. what you say, you right. know these people, you know, you right. meet them in a bar, you know, you want you want to step outside pretty soon. <laughs> but always correcting you, technically, that's yeah. not true. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so what for whatever reason, 
the one thing that was his pet peeve, the one thing that set him off was the phrase mother of God, mother of God. Now, you have to understand that the church had been using this phrase for hundreds of years, Mm -hmm. hundreds of years. And we're only talking about the year 430 here, right? And, uh, and, And there's a rich tradition of hymns. That, are, that use the phrase mother of God. The emperor Constantine had used the phrase mother of God. And even the enemies of Christianity mocked us for always singing to the mother of God because Christians love the Blessed Virgin Mary. This has always been the case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Nestorius, this fussy monk, gets mm-hmm. named to the most powerful position in the East, which is you know, the, the, the Bishop of Constantinople, right? So he's there in this emperor's city. And he starts to tell the people, well, I don't want you to use those hymns that use those phrases. I don't want you to use those prayers that, that use the phrase mother of God, because technically you can't call her mother of God. Why? Here's his logic. A mother has to precede her son in time and nobody precedes God. Right. You know, now they just kind of turned it on him and they said, Your logic is bad, because if you say that she's not the mother of God, then you're saying that her son is not God. And this is it. This is the crux of it right here, right? Right. Okay. Right. And so it became this this big conflict. The monks didn't like him. The common people didn't like him. And he managed to tick off the emperor's sister, who was a consecrated virgin in the church. So you have this conflict that's going on, and he just digs in. He just digs in. And so the people started to make up songs, like drinking songs Mm. that made fun of the way he talked. And the drinking songs would have all of his fussy phrases in it, like, Technically, you know, <laughs> Is that right? they just mocked him. They just <laughs> mocked him. And uh, and and uh, and eventually the emperor, again, it's one of these crises that's becoming threatening to the order of the empire. There are going to be riots if you don't do something about these guys, th- about this guy, because his his own people are saying that this is an affront to the Blessed Virgin Mary, whom they love. So the emperor calls a council. In Ephesus, and what, emperor, what emperor is it? Oh my! Now, oh, now never I mind. Forget. Never <laughs> mind. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. No, go but ahead. anyway, uh, the emperor calls the the council uh, in in Ephesus, which is the, a key the, place because its tradition says Mary may have lived there at some point. That's right. At the yeah, end of her life, yeah, with yeah. with Saint John. So you have uh, you have that going on, and uh, and um, and what's interesting is that the people were so wrapped up in this. Um, in this conflict that they went to Ephesus and they waited outside the council chambers in the blistering heat of the summer. Deadly heat. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and what's interesting is, uh, is that, uh, the way the bishops worked the council is that they tried to use that summer heat against their opponents, some of whom were more than 100 years old. And these 100-year-old bishops were dying in the heat in Ephesus. But They, literally, they were literally it. dying. That's right. They, yeah. They're literally dying at the council. And, and they didn't care. They were going to be there, and they were going to oppose the, this doctrine of Nestorius, which was a dangerous thing. So, so – um, the people just gathered and they waited and they waited and they waited to hear what the, the, the council would say. And the beautiful thing is that when they came out to announce their decision, the people took the bishops up on their shoulders and carried them through the city in mm. this torchlight parade, singing Marian hymns and, and swinging incense you know, throughout the city. You know, so they're singing – the the ancient equivalent of Hail Holy Queen and Immaculate Mary as they carry the bishops through the city on their shoulders and uh, and 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 celebrate the great decision of the Council of Ephesus. But Nestorius is one of those those uh, those those villains I love best because their the story is so amusing. Well, it's 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 such a mystery too. The whole thing. The the I think the key phrase that came out of there was Theotokos. Is that right? Yes, yeah, God bearer. Yeah, and you see that. What does that describe that for us? Uh, well, uh, you, you know, the, when when they were uh, that that is an ancient uh, phrase, an ancient word used to describe the Blessed Virgin Mary. The the earliest instance we have 
on a scrap of paper is from the early 200s. And and it's the, the Subtuum Presidium prayer, which was enormously popular I- even in the third century. We have examples of it in many languages. So again, this phrase, Theotokos, is... is um, is is uh, is well established in Christian tradition. It's well established in Christian prayer. And all of a sudden, Nestorius is coming on the scene late in the day and saying, "I want you to stop using that." And people are angry. They're saying, "You're telling me not to use the prayers that my granddaddy taught me?" Mm-hmm. No, they're not going to go along with that. And and they're right in doing that in going along with the tradition that goes back to the apostles of venerating the Blessed Virgin well, Mary. But let me ask you this: You know, the, the, what brought me back to uh, I never understood Mary for most of my life. What the first thing that struck me, what kind of was the cracking point, after I had happened to go to Lourdes, by the way, uh, was the was the God bearer thing. Um, yeah, and it was particularly uh, when you see um, David bringing in the Ark of the Covenant into his home, and he says, you know, uh, this is, you know, he, he, who, who am I that the, that the ark of the Lord would come into my home? And then yeah. you see Elizabeth saying that to Mary, who is this that the mother of my Lord would come into my home? And then you see John in Revelation describing, he sees the ark of the covenant, and he's, he describes a woman. That cracked everything open for me. But yes. I, I got to take us one more step here. We only have a couple minutes. In light of this book and in light of what's going on in the church today, what hope does this book do the, these stories point to us as far as uh, bishops that may not be totally in order and the scandal that's going on? Oh, you got three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> all the hope you'll ever need, uh, because no, no matter no matter what happens, you know there's there's precedent for it in history. There have always been villains. There have been villains inside the church. There have been villains outside the church, and. You know, the, the Christians have had to face this in their lifetimes. What's, what's interesting is that the fathers of the church show us how to deal with that. Deal with it, you know, in strength. Deal with it in clarity. Be firm, but be loving. Because what's interesting is that they, that they always try to love the villains, you know. the Yeah. The, yeah, that's the amazing thing. Even like, in the apocryphal right later on. Yes. They all seem, yeah. To, yeah, they all seem to come to a— that's beautiful. Yeah, you know, like the story of Caiaphas. There were legends about Caiaphas, you know, the great New Testament villain. Uh, there were legends about Caiaphas coming to Christian faith at the end of his life. Uh, you find legends about Pontius Pilate coming to Christian faith at the end of his life. So, and, and you even find that about Judas, people trying to find a loophole for Judas. They don't succeed. But, uh, but you know, this is, this is it. In, in this time right now, where we're in the church— we need to be faithful to the teaching of the church. We need to be able to challenge our bishops when we feel that they're out of order, but do that in a way that is respectful of, of their position yes. and, of, and of the of, of the of the tradition, the the beauty of, of our beautiful, beautiful Catholic Church. Mike Aquilina, when is your next book coming? Well, I got to get you on, of course, before your next book comes out. But <laughs> thank you so much for this book, um, "The Villains of the Early Church." It's a great read. It's very informative, and it's and as usual, uh, it's kind of funny to say this, but your books are always a page turner. Even though they may be about <clears throat> whatever theology or whatever it is, they're always a page turner. So, well, thank uh, you. Thank you so much for being my friend and being on the show again with us. Uh, until next week, we got to sign off. Do you want to say Viva Cristo Rey with me? <laughs> Viva Cristo Rey. <laughs> Viva Cristo Rey. How about, how about Mele Kaliki Maka? Can you say that, Mike Aquilina? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a letter to, a, to a, someone the other day, a priest that I'm inviting to be on the show. And I signed it, Bear Wozniak, underneath it, I put Mele Kaliki Maka, meaning Merry Christmas. And he writes back to us, Dear Bear and Mele. So he thought it was another person's name. <laughs> so, anyway, we got to go, Mike. Um, thank you so much Man, for being our fun. guest. Uh, and we'll and go to our website, deepadventure.com, find out more about our ministry. Uh, aloha. <laughs> <laughs>